And it is my great pleasure to introduce the three students who worked on my undergraduate scholars project, uh, Brandon Cox, Jamie Leah Carter, and Wenjing Shi. Together, we constructed a corpus of spoken English, that is to say, a collection of naturally occurring speech, professionally transcribed, that is used for research in linguistics. Uh, and I invite you all to check out the final result under www.spokencorpus.org. That's www.spokencorpus.org. Uh, Jamie, Brandon, and Wenjing not only did a fantastic job and they showed great dedication to the project, but they also just, you know, are really pleasant and smart. They, they submitted fantastically accurate transcripts. They made great suggestions and actually introduced me to a couple of new ideas and linguistic phenomena. So they're just really pleasant to be around with and I feel quite privileged to have met them. So uh, great job guys, proud of you. And I hope you will continue to um, work so successfully in your future academic endeavors. So now I'll hand it over uh, to them and I hope you will enjoy their presentation on conducting corpus-based research uh, with spoken language corpora. Um, wow, well, thank you, Richard. Um, so now I will begin our presentation. Um, next slide, please. Um, firstly, I want to um, briefly talk about our project. Our project is relatively practical as well as interesting. Um, I think our project can be divided into two parts. In the first part, we learn how to transcribe speech professionally. While in the second part, we learn how to use spoken corpus data for a linguistic research question. Um, next page, please. Um, here are some key points about the corpus of our project. Um, firstly, our project, uh, our corpus is built by Dr. Richard and uh, it is a collection of student-made speech transcriptions and uh, the corresponding audio files. An important point is that this corpus is about spoken American English. So all speakers here are natives of American English. Um, so far, there are um, 97,605 word tokens in total. So it will be a long-term work to expand the corpus larger in the future. Next, uh, Brandon will show us the transcription process in detail. So here we just have a video describing how the transcription was done. So the first thing we did was go to YouTube and find the file we want. Though I don't show it in this clip, we then download the audio file for the clip and open that in Audacity. Audacity is used to clip and trim audio. Each audio clip correlates to a sentence token. A sentence token is defined in the transcription manual, taken directly from the Spoken Corpus website. The numbers at the bottom represent the sentence token number. Next, you will hear two tokens spoken by Quentin Tarantino. So I was interested in stories, and I was really interested in reading, all right? We then go to Notepad++ or any other TXT file editor and jot down our transcription. The transcription must include an accurate timestamp. Once the tokens have been accurately transcribed and the audio has been separated into tokens, the data is ready to enter the corpus. You can then search the corpus for a word or sentence token. In our case, the corpus was ready to be used to start our analysis. So after building the corpus further, we chose to use it as a tool for linguistic research. Uh, we wanted to find out more about the variations in vocabulary between speakers and what might cause these. Specifically, we chose to contrast the linguistic hedges kind of and sort of. So our research question shown here is what are 
determinants of the variation between the hedges sort of and kind of in spoken American English. To give you a better idea of the data we were looking for, we've included two examples from the corpus. Uh, example one, so that was sort of a good experience, and two, 2018 was kind of a depressing year. Next slide, please. So our first step um, was to use the corpus to search for all instances of kind of and sort of. You can see the results here on the left. Um, the corpus is really useful because the results include a soundbite and a lot of information on the speaker. Um, next, we used a spreadsheet to compile these along with the information on the speakers. Uh, we then manually went through and omitted instances where kind of and sort of meant type of, in which case they weren't used as hedges and were instead used to categorize. Uh, this wasn't always simple, such as in the example on the top right. Uh, we sometimes needed a bit of discussion. Um, in some instances, listening to the speaker's emphasis on the recording did help a lot. Uh, when we were happy with our data, we input this information into the program R and used various codes shown on the bottom left to gather results and plot our graphs. Each member of the group focused on a different aspect of the speakers to see which would be more notable. And I find is are as follows. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to find out if a speaker's age had an impact on the use of kind of and sort of. Um, along the X axis, you can see the year of birth of the speaker and the Y axis shows the use of either kind of or sort of. Um, at zero, the speaker uses sort of exclusively and at one, kind of exclusively. Uh, we see that many people use a mixture of the two uh, to different degrees. Uh, each red circle is an instance of a hedge. The larger the circle, the more instances. The blue line shows that there's a definite trend over time with kind of becoming increasingly popular compared to in the past. Uh, we can see that in general, our corpus shows more usage of kind of than sort of, um, but we have to keep in mind that this applies only to speakers of our corpus, which is still relatively small. Um, these results are statistically significant and promising, but we would need more speakers in order to put forward a strong conclusion. Next slide, please. Um, the next possible factor that we analysed uh, was the dialectal area of the speaker. So we um, were taking the latitude and the longitude values of the place in which each speaker grew up. Um, and that enabled us to create this map uh, where red dots, they, uh, they indicate instances of the hedge sort of, and blue dots indicate instances of the hedge kind of. Uh, the larger the circle, the uh, greater the number of instances of each hedge. Glancing at the graph, uh, it seems that kind of is favored in Los Angeles, um, whereas sort of is sort of preferred in, sort of preferred in uh, New York. Uh, we see a smattering of blue data points in the Midwest, sort of around here, um, but the additional presence of red data points, for example, those two there, um, in, uh, it sort of makes it difficult to draw a meaningful conclusion about the spoken American English in the Midwest. Um, and in fact, uh, just from the graph alone, it is quite difficult to discern any pattern. And what makes this harder is that the data set is only driven by 30 speakers, which is a very small number from which to make any generalizations. Um, so when the corpus is larger, perhaps this hedge comparison can be made with greater reliability. Um, so in this section, I wanted to investigate whether the education level has an influence on the use of the hedges, sort of and kind of. And uh, that's what you can see in this plot. Um, here, the blue bar represents higher education level and uh, the orange bar represents lower education category. And uh, then I apply the chi-square test and the result is shown in, on the screen. Um, since the p-value is smaller than 0 0.001, we can conclude that the difference between the blue bar and the orange bar is significant. Um, next, in this graph, you can see that the lower education category use less sort of. Um, in order to quantify this, I use gets odds ratio. Again, I put the results above. Um, here, the odds ratio 0 0.1 represents that the blue bar is 10 times as high as the orange bar. Um, it means that the odds that a poorly educated speaker would use sort of are only about one tenth of those odds for highly educated speakers. And uh, this effect seems to be very strong for me. 
Um, finally, this study is confounding with age because previously in Jamie's study, we've already established a change that older speakers use more sort of than young speakers. Um, but old speakers also tend to be more educated. According to the categorizing rules here we use uh, in this project, um, for young speakers who are still in college and haven't got their master's degree yet, they will all fall into the lower education category. Um, so there is a correlation between age and the education. As you grow older, um, you also get more educated. But there is also a change going on, such that old speakers use more sort of. So that, so that change is also included in this graph. In other words, we can say that this graph does not um, con control for age. Next slide, please. Um, then this uh, slide lists out all our major findings of the project um, by comparing sort of and uh, kind of. For sort of, uh, it is more conservative and uh, it possibly used more in northern states. Also, it is mostly used by people with a higher education. Well, for kind of, it is becoming more popular nowadays and uh, it is burst more um, inconsistently. Mm, meanwhile, it is used by people of both uh, lower education level and the higher education level, but more by lower educated speakers. Uh, next page, please. Um, finally, here comes to the conclusion of our project. Since the corpus is relatively small now, our findings are still not too clear. In this case, uh, we would be interested in revisiting our research question again in the future uh, when the corpus is growing larger. Uh, here, I also list out some useful useful skills we've learned from the project. For example, we learned how to do professional transcription. Also, we learned how to use audio editing software like Audacity. Um, moreover, we learned how to use our program to analyze data. It also practiced our um, coding skills. So that's all for our presentation. Thank you for listening. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. That was really great. It's, the, the sort of breadth of the different presentations is, is so, so interesting to, to hear. Does anyone have any questions for the group? Oh, Vera, your hand is raised. Hey, thank you for this presentation. I think the results are really interesting also from the perspective of the research that's been done on like insertion in English, right? Um, I think that goes in terms of the pragmatic function and its semantics has a similar status like kind of and sort of. Um, and for like insertion, we observe exactly that, that it starts out in a particular age group, in a particular place, and then kind of spreads uh, across the age groups. Um, um, and now it's attested um, in court proceedings in, in, in kind of professional settings uh, that it wasn't, um, that we wouldn't find it before. So if you were interested in pursuing that further, I think it might be interesting to relate it to that research and like insertion and, and also look at the parallels and potentially also differences, uh, especially the educational difference. And I found quite interesting. So, so that's a very nice project. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's not a question, sorry. It's just a comment. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just a, a little question. Uh, what is exactly a corpus-based research? Is it based on people? I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure like you explained it a little bit. I'm just not sure I get it. Um, does any of you want to take that question? Um, I'm trying to put my my video on, but it's not letting me. 
Oh, sorry. That's what I was trying to uh, stop sharing your screen and uh, oh, okay. I, think I stopped your video by accident. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it should be able to do it now, I think. Oh, there you go. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, so a corpus is uh, a body of texts of language um, in any language that has been compiled by linguists um, and are usually, especially nowadays, online or are um, at least they are collections of texts that are on computers so that you can use um, the power of uh, your computers to search for certain items. Um, it's a way of documenting a uh, language that is current as well as um, quite old as well. Um, and when you uh, have these kinds of corpus, uh, corpora, you can track changes throughout time. Um, for example, you can, uh, you can use them for lots of different purposes. For example, forensic linguistics. Um, there are corpora that are used by um, people in law enforcement to try and track kind of small um, linguistic idiosyncrasies uh, and that's used, um, that's, that's done through corpora as well. Thank I think that's much. a little definition. <laughs> Thank you, Brendan, that was really helpful. Thank you. All that.